Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, we're back. We're live here. It's a Monday morning, 10 o'clock. And uh, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii. And we're going to do Think Tech Asia right now. And we're going to talk with Richard Hornick. Richard Hornick is a journalist. Journalist, can I say that? Um. <laughs> He's a lecturer at uh, Stony Brook University in New York. But he's much more than that because he's spent uh, years and decades covering China for Time magazine and other organizations. And he's been around the news media that, that covered China for his whole, his whole professional life. And we have the joy of having him here. He gave a, um, he gave a talk uh, not too long ago at the China Seminar, uh, which is an important organization in Hawaii, which covers China and uh, reveals things about China you wouldn't otherwise know. And Richard spoke there about, um, what is it, mind control in China. So I found a remarkable education for myself. Uh, we made a uh, movie for uh, OC16, which played a couple of weeks ago. If you have a chance, look that up on OC16.tv. And, um, and he's here with us today to talk about the same subject. Welcome, welcome to our show, Richard. Jay, it's always a pleasure to be here. It's great to have you. So let's talk about China. You know, until we talking until five years ago or so, it looked like it was getting you know more democratic, more like the U.S. It was opening its mind, so to speak, opening its heart, and uh, we could have at least in the future, um, you know, an evolving improvement of our relationship with them. But something happened uh, with Xi Jinping. What, what happened? Well, I don't think you know they were ever going to be a democracy like the United States. I think what they were striving for was to find an Asian path to uh, uh, creating accountability for their, for their government. Um, that's what most people want in the world. Is, you know, if you ask most Chinese, do you want to vote for president, they'd say, why? You know, that's not, but make sure that the local party chief doesn't you know, steal the best land every year when they're doing the, uh, the, the land appropriations. <laughs> um, and you know, that, they were moving along, and they were using, I thought, one of the most interesting elements was they were using social media as a way of getting around having a, 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 an electoral process. Because you could follow very easily how people felt. And, and, and people were using social media to out corrupt officials. I, I showed you at the, at the speech, this, uh, the, the, the talk, this guy who the, With the, government, wrist the government official who was caught on, you know, on camera laughing at a horrible uh, traffic oh, accident. Sure, yeah. And then the, the people, the netizens of China went out and found you know, ways that they could uh, look, look him up. And he had a different wristwatch on almost every day, and they were very expensive. <laughs> and he wound up in going to jail. And so I was, I thought this was very uh, positive. And in fact, I, I really thought that what had happened was they had managed, the, what social media was doing was to defeat the, the key uh, strategy of any authoritarian government, and that is to atomize the population. What does atomize mean? It means that everyone has to keep to themselves what they think. Yeah. So you and I, if you were living in, uh, I covered Poland during the 1980s, early 80s, and, and people were afraid to say what they thought because I didn't know if you were a, a spy, right? And so I kept, so people were go, people in these societies go around thinking, well, maybe everybody else is happy. Maybe I'm the wrong, maybe I'm wrong. And every once in a while, that explodes, and well, social media blew that up. Social media made it possible for people to see that they weren't crazy. They weren't the only ones who thought, you know, that this was not the way it should be. And um, you know, I remember something about the the Chinese culture. I mean, mm -hmm. that that if the government doesn't work for you, if it doesn't provide a working mm -hmm. economy and quality of life, then there's an inherent right of the people to turn it up, uh, you know, to, to change it, uh, maybe by revolution. Right. Well, I, I, it's a little uh, less direct than that. It's, you know, the sort of the mandate of, of, of heaven. Yes. So uh, in Confucian uh, uh, philosophy, it is the duty of the government to care for the people. And if they don't, then the mandate of heaven will be withdrawn. And that normally, uh, over Chinese history, uh, 
was evidenced by peasant riots and uh, revolutions and that sort of thing. But if you have the social media outlet, right. then you relieve that stress somehow. Well, and, and it's not just relieving the stress. It provides the one thing that authoritarian regimes never have, which is a feedback loop. The only feedback loop they have is from spies. You know, people, and those spies may be corrupt. They may be you know, doing, you know, reporting that you're a bad guy because, you know, you're, they will like your girlfriend and they want you to, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty standard. But with social media, you have, you know, the wisdom of crowds. You have lots and lots of inputs. So I'm not just relying on a bunch of, you know, spies who may or may not be corrupt. I, I'm relying on the whole society to tell yeah. me what's going on. So what's so interesting about this is that social media requires, required, uh, technology required the internet and all that, and, and, and China was going, you know, big time on ex mm -hmm. expanding the internet at the time. But now the technology is used for maybe a different purpose. Right. Can you explain what happened in the last five years? <clears throat> yeah, well, I mean, first, the first thing that happened was they, uh, China decided that, um, and they've always had a kind of uh, love-hate relationship with, that, with the outside world. And they decided that the internet was creating, uh, bringing in too much bad, too many bad influences. You know, Deng Xiaoping, when he opened China to the to the outside world, he said, you know, when you open the window, some flies may come in. Well, I think they thought that you know a whole swarm of mosquitoes were coming in. And so the first thing they did in uh, 2011 was to create what they call the Great Firewall of China, which is to block. Chinese netizens from access to the outside world. So no Facebook, no, uh, no Google, no uh, uh, Twitter, all of that. And they created their own versions, which were very, very successful. Um, so, so, that, so that's the first thing that happened. The second thing that happened was that uh, in 2012, uh, Xi Jinping uh, was chosen as the new leader. And um, he was confronted with a, a very, very difficult situation. Corruption in all of this wonderful openness that we were talking about and all this economic growth, there was an enormous amount of corruption, especially after the 2008 financial collapse when they had to pump billions and bill trillions of, of, of renminbi into the system. And, and he basically decided that the only way to fix this was to shut everything down and to start really controlling society using social media and, and the internet and other technologies, not as a feedback loop, but as a way of controlling the Chinese mind or closing the Chinese mind. And that's what's been going on for the last five years. So are people aware, do they tolerate this? Is this something where if you're having a good middle class life, you're not going to complain about it, and even though you know things have changed? Yeah, I think um, absolutely. And, and you know, it's... It, there are, it doesn't affect most people. You know, most people are perfectly happy. It only affects you when it's uh, just like here, I suppose, when, you know, whose ox got gored. You know, if you're living in a town uh, in the city and everything is fine and dandy and, you know, so what if I can't, you know, see, you know, what's going on, you know, on Google or, or Facebook? Who cares? If you know people are being uh, shut down for saying negative things, it doesn't matter. But if you live in a city or a town where there is a problem, like a new chemical factory is being built, then you know, and you're really afraid of the pollution, or it's already been built, and or the pollution, is, and then you can't say anything, then people uh, sort of push back. So um, it's it's you know it's a mixed bag. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so I guess most people would say, I, I don't want to get into an argument mm -hmm, about this. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to be punished in mm -hmm. any way, so I'll just let, let it go. And mm -hmm. I don't care about Google and Facebook. Right. So how has it evolved um, in those years um, with the success of the governments of Xi Jinping's initiative to close down the Chinese mind? Well, it's becoming, it's, each, it's incremental. So they started with the outside, and then they, they started clamping down on internal communication. So, for example, uh, I don't know if you're on Twitter, but um, on Twitter you can have uh, any sort of handle name you want, and there's no... It's anonymous. It's anonymous. In China, they have effectively eliminated all anonymous handles. You have to have real registration. That's number one. So, if you say something, they know about it. And they have 200,000, 400,000 people who do nothing but, but scan social media for people saying untoward things. 
Can we take a digression at that sure, point? Sure. But I have this vision of a huge big building somewhere in Beijing, which doesn't have a lot of windows and which has a lot of security around it. And all these guys who never tell you on the outside what they do for a living mm -hmm. are in there scanning everything that goes over the internet. How, how far off am I? I don't think it, it uh, there are, there's a couple of buildings but, uh, like that, but they're, they're doing other things. They're doing more sort of outward. Uh, they're the people who are trying to steal information from the US government and that sort of thing. This can be, because of the, the nature of the job, it can be uh, distributed widely. You sure. can do it from your home. But it's always secret. You don't know. Oh, no, no. I mean, uh, I think most people, no, it's not really secret. They, they, they're pretty open about so it. So if I'm doing, if I'm scanning your email, whatever right. it is, I, I'm, I'm a scanner. That's right. what I do. I mean, most of it is done through artificial intelligence. I mean, they're always looking for keywords, June 4th, 1989, you know, those sorts of things. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, as I said the other day, you know, every, they keep updating these lists and then they plug that in and the artificial intelligence will go through. So the latest one, or not the latest, but recent was a year or so ago when, uh, when Obama visited China and, uh, or, or anyway, Obama and, and uh, Xi Jinping were walking together. Somebody uh, decided that it looked like, Xi Jinping looked like Winnie the Pooh and uh, Obama <laughs> looked like Tigger. And so that, so Winnie the Pooh is now a forbidden term in, in China. Anyway, so there, you know, it, it's at that level. Um, but more recently, uh, they have made every uh, platform responsible for all of the content. Now here in the United States, for many, many years, they're beginning to change a little bit, but Facebook and Twitter and Google have said, you know, we're just a carrier. We don't, we, you know, we don't have any responsibility for what people say. And they've that, been that, successful in and that they, Well, except it's changing. They're now, having, they're now being forced to accept. In okay. fact, I just saw Unilever is uh, threatening to withdraw all of their advertising from Facebook and Twitter uh, and other, uh, other platforms if they don't crack down on all of this horrible, you know, fake, But it's not fake, the government. But it's not the government. Yeah. Um, although people, I, you know, you could argue that they're afraid that the government would, would, inve uh, would investigate it. But anyway, if you're Weibo, and if I, if I own Weibo, and you, are, uh, you post something that's incendiary, and I don't take it right down, they come after me and you, but they come after me. So it, it, it's, it's really been quite effective that yeah. way. But, you know, there's still elements. But um, to me, what's, uh, what's more, and we were talking about, uh, you know, what is the, you know, the surveillance state going to be like? So the Chinese have taken the latest technologies, facial recognition, uh, uh, you know, how to uh, scanning the Internet, and they are developing a, a, a sort of a 1984 approach. So that, um, for example, in the last uh, few weeks, the, uh, I forget, some major city in, in China, in the railroad station there, they've arrested eight people who they know or are known or to be criminals based on facial recognition software, sort of like the minority report. You know, they, but more like the minority report, they are developing a social credit rating system. So you have a FICA score. You can you know, borrow money based on your whatever it is, 700, you know, you, rates are low, 500, you have trouble getting a loan. In China, what they want to do is create a social credit rating where they watch everything you do on the internet, again, using artificial intelligence. So if you go to pornographic sites, and that's a, you know, not, it, that's against you. If you buy, uh, uh, you know, uh, books that are sort of incendiary, that's that's against you. If you are caught doing bad things in the airport, you know, they've had lots of problems with their tourists, you know, opening plane doors and that sort of. All of this stuff gets funneled into a new social credit rating system, which they're hoping to have complete within a couple of years, and, and, and that and that will be used to decide if you get a job. It might even be used to decide if they'll sell you a ticket to get on a high-speed train because you've been a bad boy in the past. So that is uh, that to me is the most uh, sort of chilling thing. Well, it's, it's chilling in the sense that it's you know in the case of Equifax, that's a private company, right? Not necessarily available to the government. <laughs> Here, it's the government doing it. Actually, it's not. It's the Chinese um, uh, platforms who are doing it at the behest of the government. So it's Alibaba and Weibo and all, and, and they're, so they're doing this, yeah. which raises a, a separate issue, which is, do you want to share your information as a non-Chinese with these companies? 
Alibaba would like to, you know, challenge Amazon here in the United States. Weibo would like to challenge Facebook and Twitter. Uh, uh, Huawei, uh, the communications manufacturer, wants to sell equipment uh, for 5G. The new uh, uh, Xiaomi uh, makes uh, these cheap mobile phones. But uh, you know, you have to uh, assume uh, that everything, everything is going to get back to the fact, Chinese government. Yeah, yeah. and in fact. Um, uh, I just saw this, a, a journalist in China who went in for her, American, who went in for her annual visa uh, conversation, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the official said, you know, we, we see you tried to organize a meeting on December 8th, and it was not done through her public thing. It was done through, uh, you know, WeChat, through a, a very, what's supposed to be private. So, you know, they're, they're obviously surveilling this. Now, when I was in China in the mid-80s, we assumed that all of our phone calls were being listened to and that we were being followed and that sort of stuff. But what this does is it gives a po the possibility to watch everybody all the time. And you don't know what they have on you. You don't know what right. Your, right. your social media rating right. or your right. social rating is. Well, how many people do you know over the years who have had uh, credit scores that were lower than they should be because... It was some bogus piece of information or somebody, somebody yeah. misreported it yeah. or they cleared a debt and it never got reported back. I mean, these companies are incredibly fallible as, as uh, Equifax has more than demonstrated. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it, yeah, you could be, want, find yourself in a very, very difficult situation. Chilling is the word. Yeah. Richard Hornick, you know, this is very chilling. Um, it was chilling when we heard it at the, uh, at the China Seminar, which is uh, actually within the Friends of the East-West Center and therefore mm -hmm. under, the, under the rubric of the East-West Center. Uh, in fact, Richard was at the East-West Center for a time, yeah? Yes, 1993-94. Uh, yeah. Anyway, we're, we're going to take a break now. When we come back, we're going to find out just exactly how more chilling it is <laughs> <laughs> and, how, and how it does mind control on everyone in China. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Ethan Elm, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science, where we'll dig into science, dig into the meat of science, dig into the joy and delight of science. We'll discover why science is indeed fun, why science is interesting, why people should care about science, and care about the research that's being done out there. It's all great, it's all entertaining, it's all educational, so I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. Okay, we're back on Think Tech Asia with Richard Hornick, a journalist, journalist who is speaking today uh, about uh, about China and its uh, attempts and successful attempts to do mind control in the Xi Jinping administration, which is likely to go on for a few years, actually. Um, so, you know, one of the interesting things is that, in my view, is that people, you know, until this sort of began to happen and foment into the press, mm -hmm. didn't know. They thought it was heading in a good direction internally, you know, in the, in the daily life of the city. Everybody was very impressed with the technology, and the Chinese had all these new systems, which often were reminiscent of American mm -hmm. systems. Um, but now there's, there's a bit of a dark side to that. So tell me, it's not China bashing. It's China skepticism, and there's a difference, right? Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, my view is that I see the potential of China. I see what they could be doing with social media, with all of these things. And, I, and it, to me, it's, it's a shame. Because what I, I don't call it mind control. I call it my, my talk was called the, uh, the closing of the Chinese mind. And if China wants to be that superpower in the 21st century, they need to go up the economic ladder. And that economic ladder, going up the ladder from being an assembler to being an inventor, uh, you know, avoiding the middle income trap that I talked about a year ago, that requires innovation. And innovation requires collaboration. And it requires open communication. 
And so, yes, I, uh, Xi Jinping is trying to close the Chinese mind. And, and he's not doing it because he thinks it's, that's a great idea. He's doing it because he thinks he has to. He, he inherited a, you know, a dumpster fire. A China, you know, the corruption was out of control. As I said the other day, I, I, I'm not sure I would do anything differently than he does. He's f facing a billion four, uh, 1.4 billion people who um, many are happy, many are very dis discontented. You know, they're, they're, there's lots of, 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 of issues out there, and there's a lot of, of corruption. Um, they, they have a lot of problems, and he's trying to get his arms around that, and his view is that this is the best way to do it. And, you know, maybe in the short run he's right. But for me, the history of China is, um, is one where the swings are between total control and, and complete chaos. Uh, you know, the Chinese have a word, Luan, and they, they're, they're, they're absolutely horrified at, at the thought of chaos. Chaos is the Cultural Revolution. Chaos is you know, Tiananmen. Chaos is, you know, the Peasants' Revolt, the Boxers' Rebellion, all those things. Lack of order. Lack, more than a lack of order, just a lack of, of any civility, whatever. It's dog, you know, it goes back to sort of, you know, uh, uh, dog-eat-dog, Hobbesian. Anyway, but I think one of the reasons they have these episodes is that they're so intent on maintaining order that eventually all of these, these things that get you know, pent up will explode. So it would be better to have them out a little bit. You know? So most countries are somewhere on a continuum between order and chaos, you know, somewhere in here, right? And China is always it's binary. It's one or the other. And when it blows, and it will blow at some point, it, you know, and maybe 40 years, maybe 100 years, I don't know. But um, I, I, you know, I, anyway, I, I think Xi Jinping is doing the best he can. I don't think he's a bad guy. I think he really thinks this is what, what China needs. And, um, you know, we'll see. Is this, 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 may I use your term, atomization, this mm -hmm. kind of, you know, going toward atomization changes the way people collaborate right. because they're afraid of what they might say, get them in trouble somehow, even right. if they didn't intend it to, right. to get them in trouble. Right. And so they shut down. Right. Therefore, you don't have the collaboration you need for, um, you know, for creativity. Right. And Absolutely. this is going to affect them ultimately, for well, sure. Well, and also, they're, you know, even Chinese companies that have subsidiaries, you know, they're, they're doing the same thing the Japanese did. They're buying Western companies for their technology and innovation and that sort of thing. But because of the, this great firewall of China, they're now, they're about to cut off one of the last ways that you could get access to the outside world, which is the VPNs, virtual private networks. And this is going to hurt Chinese companies as much as it hurts Western companies that are trying to, do, uh, to operate in China. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's not the sort of thing that you know, creates problems right away. Again, it's this, the failure to fulfill the potential that they have. Right, that, which that, is huge. Which is huge. Yeah. And especially in this field. The one thing you talked about in your comments, which I'd like to cover, is, uh, is academic freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, well, freedom of speech in general, but mm -hmm. also academic freedom. So how does this affect the, the press? How does this affect, um, you know, teachers, faculty teaching in universities? Well, um, over the last, again, five years, there's been a real crackdown within universities. For the first time, about three years ago, for the first time in, since Mao, uh, a professor was uh, sent to jail for a, a lecture he gave inside a classroom. There's always been a sort of wall around the university. The university, you know, the academic inquiry was, especially since, you know, the, since the end of the Cultural Revolution, was, was permitted. Um, and that has been, that, that is being cut down. The other thing is that they're really reinforcing the need to study uh, Marxism-Leninism, Mao Zedong thought. Uh, now they've added Xi Jinping thought as part of it. That's so, extraordinary, isn't it? It is. I mean, you know, the, the, the yeah, it's actually in the Constitution now. Uh, Xi Jinping is probably more, is, is definitely, uh, has more power at this point in time than Deng Xiaoping ever did. More like Mao. More, much more like Mao. And they're even using the same terminology. They've been, they've, they've uh, photoshopped his portrait to make him look a little bit more <laughs> like Mao. Um, you know, they've, uh, it's, you know, they've, it's, the cult of the personality is, is, is really going on. And again, you know, this may be something that he thinks is necessary. Um, I don't think he's doing it because of his ego. I think, you know, it's all part of this, this process.
But you know, the, yeah, the, so that was the, the point of my talk was the, the, the closing of the Chinese mind is that you stop academic inquiry. The, the news media have been way uh, cut back. You know, five years ago, they were starting to do some really interesting things. Uh, but there's almost nothing left of, of that. Um, so it's become more and more difficult for people to exchange ideas. And you know, it's not just in China, because this is washing out into American universities that have campuses in China. It's uh, affecting American universities that have things like the Confucius Institute, which does the Chinese language training and then uses that as a lever to get, you know, keep universities yeah. from inviting the Dalai Lama. The University of California, San Diego had the Dalai Lama do a, uh, give a, a commencement address. And the Chinese uh, office that, that uh, handles overseas uh, scholarships uh, has blacklisted the University of California at San because Diego of that. because of that. Yeah. So, you know, and you mentioned that in Canada, the Canadian government has shut down I, all I, of It wasn't the Canadian government, it was actually Canadian academics. Really? Yeah, and wow. the University of Chicago has kicked... Uh, kicked they sh the, shut down the Confucius Institute, yeah, you can't yeah, be on my right, campus. Right, no, because yeah. of these, you know, problems. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is, it, it's not super important, but, you know, there are uh, other ways that, you know, that's kind of, you know, they're trying to infiltrate uh, yeah, and, to, and will have some impact. Yeah. Well, and, and ultimately it'll have an impact on relations with them, don't you think? Yeah. I mean, it's so hard to separate the noise of Trump from, you know, what's really going on uh, in, you know, U.S.-China relations. But look, you know, China deserves to have the respect of the world. Uh, it is an enormous power. It's the second largest economy in the world. They have great military prowess. And they have a neighborhood. Just, you know, we have Latin America and the Caribbean. This is their, you know, their way they view it. You know, we have the Monroe Doctrine. Why shouldn't they, you know, have the same sort of latitude in their part One of the belt, world? one road. They're <laughs> trying to have influence everywhere. Yeah, I think that's, you know, that's going to get them into the hubris uh, <laughs> uh, thing. I mean, As I, you I, mentioned, there's no word in, in Mandarin for hubris. Supposedly, right. Yeah. <laughs> but um, because that's a real uh, sense of overreach. And, you know, they've got other problems, which nobody, you know, the, the, the people don't really talk about that much. I mean, they still, they, they don't have the, the cash reserves that they did even a year ago, a year and a half ago. They lost about a trillion and, you know, dollars in capital flight and other things in, in 2015, 2016, 17. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, so w where's all the money going to come from for this one belt, one road? And also, where are the, where's the feedback loop? Mo many of the investments are turning out to be not very useful. Uh, there are a lot of countries in Africa and, uh, and other places that are getting loans to build projects that will never pay for themselves. So those loans, they're concessionary, but they're still a loan. So that's on, you know, they're going to be indebted to the Chinese. There's going to be resentment. You know, they're... They, they want to be the United States. Well, you know, being the United States wasn't so much uh, fun sometimes. <laughs> it, wasn't it wasn't easy. You know, it's like, you know, the uh, Yankee go home. You know, they're going you know, there's, there's, they're to start facing that as well. So what happens with Xi Jinping now? I mean, he's been successful. Mm -hmm. This initiative about, um, you, know, uh, you know, mind, uh, what, what your term was? Uh, the closing of the closing mind. Of the mind. Yeah. Um, has been successful. Right. Nobody's really complained about right. it. Uh, he's looking for another term, isn't he? Uh, well, he, and so he's a very powerful guy. Yeah. So uh, he, he uh, the rule has been that you only get two five-year terms. And he's beginning his second five-year term now. But uh, the uh, standing committee of the Politburo uh, has no, contains no obvious successor because there's an age limit. And so there's a lot of talk, and it's just talk. Nobody knows what's going on inside Jung Nan Hai. <laughs> no, I don't care who you see. I don't care what they say. Nobody knows. Um, but if you look, you know, there's a wonderful book written in the mid-70s by a Belgian diplomat, Simon Lay, called Chinese Shadows. So we can never really see what's happening in China, but we can see the shadows on the wall, like the, uh, the, the cave in, in uh, the Play-Doh. Anyway, um, so we can see the shadows, and we can see the, you know, and that's, that seems to indicate that he has no intention of, of, of leaving. Letting go, yeah. Um, and, you know, or, you know, even if it means you know, keeping control going forward, because, again, this is, I mean, all of their real goals are, are for 2030, 2035. Um, so that's, that's, you know, another 12 years, 12 years away. 
So, um, yeah, I don't expect to see him leaving anytime soon. Uh, it's, uh, it really is chilling. Thank you so much, Richard, for this discussion. I hope we can do this again with you. There are so many other questions and issues. Happy to do it anytime, Jay. It's thank a you, Great Richard. pleasure. Richard Hornick, thank you so Thanks. much.